Good evening and welcome everybody to Silicon Valley Clean Energy's board meet, director of uh, board of directors meeting on uh, Wednesday, January 11th. Uh, this is a hybrid meeting and um, uh, uh, members are able to attend either remotely or in person and uh, public is will be invited to comment at particular moments. Uh, speakers are customarily limited to three minutes. With that introduction, let me go ahead and get started and do the call to order. Thank you. I will begin our roll call with those attending in person. I will begin with you, Vice Chair Tyson. Here. Director Scozola. Director Mohan. Here. Rennie. Here. Makachuk. Present. Walia. Here. Klein. Here. And joining us virtually, Director Hilton. Here. Meadows. Here. I'm sorry, Abbe Koga is present in Here, the yes. dais. Thank you. Chua. Here. Lee. Present. Thank you. Martinez Beltran is absent, but we do have a quorum. Great. Thank you very much. Uh, let's go to the next item, which has to do with the public comment on items not listed on the agenda. The public may provide comments on any ad matter not listed on the agenda, provided it is within the subject matter uh, within our jurisdiction. Again, customarily limited to three minutes. Let me ask if we have any uh, public comment from people in the, the room. I do see one hand up. Let's have Mr. Rod Sinks, as I say, Director Emeritus and founding board direct member. Please. Thank you, SVC board. It's wonderful to see um, familiar faces and some new faces for me here. You know, uh, this is actually the best gig in all of local government, in my view. You have a, a high functioning staff delivering service to our residents really efficiently. The leadership through the years has been stunning. We've had two fabulous executive directors and the staff is top notch. So it's a privilege to serve on this board. And I would like to, <clears throat> since I am from Cupertino, recognize our new Cupertino representative, Sheila Mohan. Um, I'm sure you'll get to know her if you haven't already met her. She has a background in finance, worked at the county for quite some time, municipal finance. So I hope she can bring the, that skill set to uh, to this board and this agency for your consideration. I've been um, spending the last couple of years since I turned out in 2020 working uh, heavily with the Cupertino Rotary Club. Um, we've started a climate action program. Uh, many other clubs in the area have done the same thing. We've been an alliance and taken advantage of SVCE rebates. And I'll tell you, um, the deal you have on heat pump water heaters is something that every uh, home in our county ought to take advantage of. And I'd like to make an appeal to you to consider <clears throat> in your new program offerings uh, when you next unfold them, think about those nonprofits in your community. Um, they, they too uh, would benefit from some of these rebates, but most of the rebates now are only available to residential customers including them perhaps as a special category of uh, commercial accounts could make a lot of sense and enable us to bring savings to you know those institutions our food banks and others um, we for example did a, a nonprofit center in mountain view recently um, and with with rooftop solar a heat pump water heater rebate was not available to them and so We'd like to see perhaps some changes there. You might also consider uh, batteries in conjunction with rooftop solar, a resiliency feature, right, for the grid, if it has real positive value. Even with NEM3, I think we're gonna have nonprofits on the uptake. Obviously, the battery is gonna make a difference. And you might consider whether these things are worthy in terms of uh, providing uh, local resiliency. Uh, given those folks at PG&E that keep the lights on sometimes. So I just want to welcome you all and, and uh, I've served with many of you and I, I honor your service. And um, George, I understand you're the only person who put their name in the, in the hat for chair, so. Let's not get ahead of ourselves, right? Okay, well that's right, some other might, but uh, uh, I would welcome your leadership of this fine institution. Thank you. 
Thank you, Rod, for those comments, and also for your continued leadership in bending the, the carbon curve. And I, I do believe I see another speaker, and that would be Mr. Bruce. Yes, Connors. thank you. I'd like to echo what Rod said about the quality of the board, the quality of the staff, and the impact that SVC has been able to make over its lifetime. I'm a Mountain View resident. I'm the chair of Carbon Tree Mountain View. I'm a frequent attendee at these meetings, so for those of you who haven't met, we'll probably see each other again soon. This has been a strange day, a strange week in the news. So I read today that Sunnyvale was determined to be the happiest town in the United States, and yet other towns nearby are underwater. Um, probably no one is happy in Planeta, California. Many in Gilroy are probably still wondering when their homes will be free of mud and debris. And of course, this is one of the many ways that the climate crisis reaches out and touches, it us, touches us at a local level. Over the Christmas vacation, I read a science fiction book by Kim Stanley Robinson called The Ministry for the Future. If anyone has read it, um, I think you might agree with me that this book does a better job than any other recent fiction book in laying out what the future might look like as the planet warms. Uh, and in some places becomes so warm and so humid that it's uninhabitable. Um, so I encourage you to grab a copy of that book uh, from the library or Kindle or wherever, and to share it with your friends and family and co-council members who may be wondering how we can afford to make the changes that we need to make over the coming decade. Um, and the reason we need to be able to afford to do that is because what will happen a decade down the road if we don't make these changes is unimaginable suffering on a wide scale. A uh, number of climate refugees that make border crises that we have known up until now seem trivial by comparison. And so you are in uh, the best position of any elected officials in our area to make the difference, to lead the communities that you live in. and, and those nearby uh, to a future that's more sustainable and will lead us all to vie with Sunnyvale for being the happiest cities in the United States. Thank you, Bruce, for those comments. And thank you also for your leadership and shall I say, sometimes being our conscience. Uh, I don't see any other public comments from people in the room. Do we have any uh, online? No hands raised, Chair. All right, very good. In that case, we will move on to uh, our next item, which is the consent calendar. And do we have any uh, board members who wish to remove or uh, any items from the consent? We do not see any in person. Do we have any hands? I, I guess I don't see any hands raised. Uh, do we? Are there just the two? Yes. Okay. All right. All right. In that case, do we have any comments or discussion from the regarding consent? I'll make the motion to move the consent calendar consisting of items 1A through 1J. Very I'll good. Second. We have a motion and a second. Do we have any public comment regarding the consent items? I see none in the room. Do we have any online? We do not. So in that case, let's go with the roll call vote. Thank you. Vice Chair Tyson? Yes. Director Scozola? Yes. Mohan? Yes. Rennie? Aye. Makachuk? Aye. Abe Koga? Aye. Walia? Aye. Klein? Aye. Hilton? Aye. Meadows? Aye. Chua? Aye. Lee? Aye. Thank you. That motion carries with Director Martinez Beltran absent. Great, thank you very much. Let's move on to the next item, which is our regular calendar, and we that'll be item two with the CEO report. CEO, Mr. Balachandran, please. Chair Tyson, members of the board, um, I have a few items to update you on. Um, first, I uh, want to recognize the fact that we have widespread outages uh, around Northern California and in our service area, and even though we don't play a role uh, per se in the T&D system, uh, I just want to recognize the hard work of the line workers who are out there restoring power, and also all your emergency workers in your cities who are out uh, cleaning up debris and getting service back. And of course, we have Santa Clara County EOC, thank you, uh, Supervisor Lee. Uh, and all the work that's being done at the county level uh, 
for public health and safety. So thank you very much for that. I'm sure there'll be time for uh, postmortems later about restoration and resiliency, et cetera. So uh, that'll come later. Earlier in 2022, the board approved us entering into our second prepay uh, transaction. Um, our CFO, Amrit Singh, and uh, members of, the, of Monica's team also have been, and uh, of course the admin finance team, have been working on it. In the next week or so, we should be making the offering for $800 million for bonds and um, we should be saving about four, we expect to save about $4 million a year. Um, also wanted to recognize the high prices that have been hitting the gas system in California. Uh, it's a bit of an anomaly. It has to do with lower storage in the Western United States, uh, some transmission, gas pipeline transmission constraints that have essentially moved up natural gas prices by between 500 to 1,000 percent of what normal is. And given that in winter, customers will be using more natural gas to, uh, for heating, that combined with higher prices in the January, February period, uh, there, there will be some higher bills. So uh, we are on alert for that. I just wanted to bring it to your attention because I'm sure that that will be something that your constituents may bring to your attention. A piece of good news, as of January 1 of this year, uh, one of the long-term renewable power contracts that the board approved back in May 2021, it's a wind project called TerraGen, 77 megawatts, serving 5% of our retail load and about two and a half percent of our compliance needs for the current, current compliance period uh, came online. Uh, so again, congrats to the board and our full pro team for bringing this online. Uh, we have a couple of additional items to update you on, on the current board roster, and I'm gonna hand it over to Andrea to close out the CEO report. Thank you, Garish. So as you can see, we have new board members on our board. So welcome to your first meeting. Um, we have a bit of a snapshot to share with you on where we are in terms of having our entire board in place. So you'll see uh, the light green is still waiting to be ratified or appointed. Uh, fingers crossed. We have all of you that are currently serving as our representatives next year. Um, so yes, I'm in close touch with your agencies and making sure that we um, have a smooth transition once we get some of our additional members appointed. You'll see we have a vacancy for a Morgan Hill alternate in addition to Santa Clara County, so they will be new. Going along that vein there, because we have new board members, uh, we would like to host orientation um, to kind of introduce you to the world of SVCE and electricity. So. Um, at the end of this month and beginning of next, we're hoping to have our first of what will be three workshops um, focused on what it is that we do in the energy landscape as a whole. So please uh, look out for an email from me requesting your availability for those. Again, that's the end of January, early February, and I'll follow up with an email um, to get your availability for that. That's the end of the CEO report. Thank you, Chair Tyson. Thank you. Um, do we have any questions or comments from uh, the board members? I don't see any in person. Are there any online? I don't see any. Do we have any questions or comments from the public? I do not see any in person and there are none online? No. Very good. Thank you very much for the CEO report. We'll now move on to the next item, item number three, which is electing a chair and vice chair for the 2023 uh, uh, period and we'll start off with uh, a presentation by Andrea. Yes, thank you. I, I don't have a presentation in terms of slides, but I do have a presentation with words. Um, but uh, at the end of last month, we did put out a call for a request for anyone interested in the role of chair or vice chair to please let us know by submitting a letter of interest uh, in your packets this evening. You'll see that we received one for, uh, for chair from Director Tyson. And we received two letters um, interested in vice chair from Director Tina Walia and Director Brian Makachuk. And again, those are in your board packets. Um, we did not receive any additional letters or indication of interest for those roles. 
Great. Thank you very much. Um, let's go ahead and proceed then. Uh, we have the first item has to do with the role of chair, and I would like to request, are there any others uh, nominations from the floor? I do not see any here. Are there, I see a hand raised. Uh, uh, Director Chua, uh, you are muted. Director Chua, you are mu muted. Oh, thank you, Chair. I was going to nominate the board member Tyson for the chair. Are you pleased? I'm happy to second. Okay. All right, we have a motion and a second. Do we have any discussion? Public comment. I don't. Uh, in that case, do we have any public comment? <laughs> it was a, it was a gesture that is uh, PG rated. If that that's, so that's a that's a good thing to have. All right. Um, with that, we return it to. Uh, we have a motion and a second. So let's do a roll call vote. Thank you. And I will start with Director Scozola. Aye. Mohan. Aye. Rennie. Aye. Makachek. Aye. Abbe Koga? Aye. Walia? Aye. Tyson? Yes. Klein? Aye. Hilton? Aye. Meadows? Aye. Chua? Aye. Lee? Aye. Thank you. That motion carries unanimously. George Tyson, chair of the 2023 SVCE Board of Directors. Well, thank you very much. I appreciate your support, and I will do, aim to do more than not disappoint you. Um, you know, and it's just, I realize this isn't part of the agenda, but just uh, we're at a moment, a moment of transition. I'm the first chair that is not a founding member of this organization. And, uh, and so even though it's a transition, I would like to say it's still a point of continuity. Having spent some time here, I think that what we've got, as you've heard from earlier comments, is a really fantastic organization. I will not screw it up is one of my goals. I have loftier goals, I'm sure, as time goes by, but we're going to keep it going and we're going to make it even better. And that's, my, that's the way I look at it. So thank you very much. You don't need a longer speech from me. Uh, and so uh, thank you again for your support. With that, I'm ready to move on to the uh, vice chair. And um, we have already received requests from two people, and I would like to see if there are any other uh, nominees from the floor. I do not see any in person, and we don't have any online. No. All right. Uh, and so what I'd like to do at this point, and I hope I'm not surprising you too much, is we have two candidates. And let's see, we'll do them in alphabetical order. Can you, can you give us, say it, we, we all, by the way, thank you for your submission. We really appreciate having a, a strong interest and it, it speaks to the strength of an organization that has that. It makes it a, a stronger to have that. And then um, we've also had a chance to read your uh, submissions. And so if you can give us, let's say up to 60 seconds or so, I run a tight ship by the way, um, <laughs> on uh, what, what brought you here and, and your qualifications. And we'll start off with Director Makachuk. Thank you. I'll be brief. Um, my introduction to SVCE was back in 2018 when I was on the Customer Program Advisory Committee. And even though it looks like I've only been a director, a new director now, I attended 13 meetings back in 2018. And then when I was elected to council in 2020, uh, I was an alternate on SVCE and uh, I joined the uh, Audit Committee and the Finance and Admin Committee. And since then, I think I attended five meetings in in 2021 and three in 2022 for finance and audit was another uh, three, six meetings. And then in 2022, I was at four meetings as the alternate director. So it may look on paper like I don't haven't been here that long, but I actually have been around for quite a few years. And I would uh, be honored to serve as vice chair. Thank you. Let's move to Director Walia. Thank you. It's been my honor to serve on Silicon Valley Clean Energy Board for two years. And this continues to be my favorite assignment. Everybody knows that. I'm deeply committed to the mission. I worked on Saratoga's climate action plan in 2009. I've worked with most city folks, your sustainability groups going all the way back. I've taught business strategy at the university, background in architecture and business. For me, uh, as mayor of Saratoga last year, I have the experience of running very effective meetings. I'm adaptable, 
collaborative decision-making life uh, style. And I fully support the tremendous technical expertise of the staff here and support all the diverse 13 cities that are part of this group to serve the customers. And I'll be honored to uh, work on this team as the vice chair. Very good, thank you. Thank you both to both of you. And then let me see if we have any comments or questions to the two candidates from uh, the board members. I do not see any in person. Oh, we do. All right. Thank you. Go ahead. Thank you. Um, I just had a few comments. I just want to thank both of you for putting your names, um, your hat. What is it? The hat in the ring. <laughs> um, as a former chair twice, <laughs> um, what I um, appreciate about this board is the collegiality. And, um, you know, it, our my time will probably be short on this board as I get ready to um, term off, but uh, we try to um, have continuity. And so I hope that for the newer members that you will be here a very long time. Um, and so I think, uh, you know, it should work out that everybody who wants to be a chair or vice chair should be able to get that uh, opportunity. Um, so in, in um, for this, uh, this round, um, I guess what I try to look at is, um, a, a reflection of our um, communities. Um, and I, I, I am very interested in um, balance and, um, you know, equity, diversity is, of course, really important to me. So um, in that regard, you know, I very much appreciate, um, again, both of you, uh, but I, I will be supporting um, um, uh, uh, board member Walia for the vice chair seat. Thank you. Thank you for those comments. Do we have any other comments in the floor uh, from the uh, podium? And then do, I don't see any uh, online. Yeah. Okay, with that, um, I think I will request comments from the public. It never hurts to do that. I don't see any, and I don't hear any online. Chua has her hand up now. Oh, okay. Uh, Director Chua. And, and by the way, let me before you speak, let me just say, I'm proposing that instead of a, a typical, say, motion, and um, I, I think that has the potential to be just a little bit awkward, and so I'm going to say in a moment I will ask um, our board secretary to just ask for each person's vote. So if you're all right with that, that's the process. I'm, I, I don't know if I s cut you short there, Director Chua, but let's go ahead and hear your comments now. Um, um, I just want... I just like uh, I just want to piggyback on uh, board members Avikova said. I really appreciate the the two of them putting their names on the hat, the hat, and it's really hard to choose between the two of them. But I will be supporting board member Tina Walia. Thank you. Okay. Right. Thank you for those comments. And then uh, we don't have any. Do we have any others online? Uh, no, I do not see any. And I do not see any. So I'm going to pass this then to our board uh, secretary. Is that your title? I should. Sure. Okay. Well, we're, we're, we're <laughs> As gonna, of, yeah, after consent, yes. We're going to roll with it. And um, why don't you do a roll call vote for us? Yes, I will do that. And in order to randomize, if you will, I will do, be doing this alphabetically by member agency. Oh. So I will begin with Campbell. Director Scozola, your vote, please. Oh, no, I didn't want to be first. Uh, <laughs> Uh, I mean, I guess I'm just going to go with the uh, comments I've heard already, uh, and it sounds like it would have been a win-win no matter who uh, got the seat. Or, but uh, yeah, I, I'm going to go with Tina Walia. Okay, thank you. Uh, Director Mohan. Yeah, I'm going with uh, uh, Tina Walia as well. Uh, I was very impressed with uh, both your statements as well as your resumes, uh, and I think both of you would be excellent. Uh, my choice for today is uh, Tina Walia. Thank you. Uh, Director Hilton. Director Walia. Thank you. Director Meadows. Director Walia, and my appreciation to both for s submitting their names for the roles. Thank you. Chair Tyson. Director Walia. Thank you. Director Rennie. Director Walia. Thank you. Director Chua. Director Walia. Thank you. Director Mekachek. I'm not sure if I should say present or not. <laughs> <laughs> but you know, I did throw the, my hat in the ring, so I will vote for myself. All right. Thank you. Director Abe Koga. Director Walia. Thank you. Director Lee. 
Yes, uh, I would like to uh, direct them to check to uh, do it again next year for this year. I vote for it tomorrow. Thank you. Okay, thank you. That was a vote for Walia. Uh, Director Walia. I'll vote for Tina Walia. Yeah, thank you. And Director Klein. Director Walia. Thank you. I see 11 votes Walia, one Makachuk, one absence. Very good, thank you. I, th I think to formalize this, uh, let's proceed with a motion. May I make a uh, motion? Go ahead. Sure. Um, I'd like to make a motion to uh, appoint Director Walia as vice chair. Thank you. I'll second the motion. Any further discussion? Any discussion from the public? I do not see any. So let's proceed with the roll call vote. Thank you. Chair Tyson. Yes. Director Scozola. Aye. Mohan. Aye. Rennie. Aye. Mekachek. Aye. Abe Koga. Aye. Walia. Aye. Klein. Aye. Hilton. Aye. Meadows. Aye. Chua. Aye. Lee. Aye. Thank you. That motion carries with Director Martinez Beltran, Tina Wally as Vice Chair of 2023 SVCE Board of Directors. Great. Thank you very much. Congratulations. Thank you. If I, if I may be permitted, I'll be very short. I'm deeply honored and humbled. Really. Thank you, each one of you. And this is a great team. As I said, my favorite assignment. And I am going to learn a lot from each one of you, including Director Mekachuk. Thank you so much. Thank you, Director or vice chair, I should say. And uh, thank you for contributing your name. And as Director Abikogo said, we're gonna be rotating around and continuity, I heard that's important. We're gonna have continuity and change at the same time. With that, uh, thank you everybody. Let's move on to item number four, which is appointing directors to the executive committee. And with that, I think we have a staff non-presentation. Yes, thank you, me again. Um, Thank you all. Um, last month, we asked that those interested in, in becoming a member of our 2023 Executive Committee to please submit their interest to me. Uh, again, this is a five-member body whose tasks are to review and provide advice to the CEO and board on policy, operational, and organizational matters. Um, so I heard from five, coincidentally, and I can go ahead and show you who those people were. We heard from Director Martinez Beltran, Makachuk, Rennie, Tyson, and Wally that they would be interested in this body. Again, this is a five member group. Great, thank you for that presentation. Do we have any comments or questions from the board? I do not see any. Do we have any online? I do not see a hand raised. No. Do we have public comment? I do not see any here in the room or in online. Correct. And with that, um, I think I'm looking for a motion. And that would be for this, this slate of five names. Go ahead, Larry. You, you don't yes, I, 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 motion, I make a motion of the slate of five names as our new executive committee. I'd like to second the motion. And we have a second. Very good, we've asked for comments already, so I think we're ready for that roll call vote. Thank you. Chair Tyson? Yes. Vice Chair Walia? Aye. Director Scozola? Aye. Mohan? Aye. Rennie? Aye. Mekachuk? Aye. Abe Koga? Aye. Klein? Aye. Hilton? Aye. Meadows? Aye. Chua? Aye. Lee? Aye. Thank you, Director Lee. I believe that was an aye vote, and that motion carries for the five aye. as presented. Great, thank you, and, and thank you everybody who's uh, stepped up. You're the only one I can reach. And, uh, and uh, we're gonna have a great year. With that, I'm ready to move on to item number five, and it's a clean energy procurement information update with a presentation from um, Chief Operating Officer and Director of Power Resources, Monica Padilla. I feel like I need to sing a song or something <laughs> to entertain you all. Uh, so tonight's presentation is just for information. It should be pretty short. I hope you find it informative though. Next slide. So um, main topics I wanna cover tonight 
are what are SBCE's clean energy goals and our progress towards meeting those goals. Some challenges we see coming up in this current year, next year, maybe even future years, and then some future initiatives that we're following. Next slide. So, <clears throat> SBCE's board since it started back in 2017 set a pretty aggressive um, objective or mission, and that is to be um, to provide carbon-free, affordable, and reliable electricity, and to provide innovative programs for the SBC community. The part that I'm responsible for, and, and uh, hopefully will inform you today, is the part that we talk about, which is the power supply section of our mission. And so the board also established a goal to be 100% clean. And so by 100% clean, that includes our a renewable portfolio standard resources and non-renewable portfolio standard resources, and to be 100% clean on an annual basis. Um, they also establish a goal to be a, at least meet the state's RPS requirements or exceed them. And through the last integrated resource planning process that we went through, we also established a target of 65% by 2030. And when I say we, I mean us together, so the board and, and staff. And then most recently in the 2022-2023 uh, strategic plan, uh, Garish and the board identified a focus area to, to explore how we would get to 24 by seven clean energy in the future. And so energy, for those of you um, who have been following what energy means, it's how much electricity we have to buy to meet every single hour or minute of our load or our, our customers' requirements. So that's what energy is. And next slide. And feel free to stop me at any point. It's, it's certainly just, um, any, I, I use a lot of acronyms, so please help me. So, um, of course, we want to serve the board's directives. But as a load serving entity or an LSC in California, we are subject to many laws and rules that are established by the California Public Utility Commission or the CPUC. Included in those are uh, several bills. SB 100 establishes essentially an RPS requirement. Starting in uh, 2020, we have to be 35.8% RPS. That is that 35.8% of all the energy that we procure on behalf of our load, our customers, has to come from what is qualified as renewable energy. So that includes things like wind, solar, geothermal, small hydro, uh, biomass. Those are all RPS resources. In addition to that, it sets a goal to be 100% carbon free by 2045. And by carbon free, again, they mean RPS resources and non-RPS resources. So things like large hydro and nuclear, those are resources that don't emit emissions. Um, SB 350 requires that 65% of the RPS per compliance period, and we're currently in what we call compliance period four, it started in 2020, 65% um, has to be met via long-term uh, power purchase agreements, or PPAs. And so the long-term being 10 years or greater. And then a recent bill that passed this year, SB 1020, requires, it sets interim targets on how much clean or carbon-free energy we have to have in 2035 and 2040 to get to that 2045 100% carbon neutral, carbon-free goal. And then as I mentioned, we are a load serving entity um, governed by, in, to some extent, by the California Public Utility Commission. They can establish what they call procurement orders. And they do that through a process called integrated resource planning. And I think you all, some of you who remember, we just recently adopted a new IRP. Uh, next slide. So this graph here shows our progress towards meeting our renewable portfolio standard. So before 2022, so when we started back in 2017, we essentially were able to hit a 50% RPS. And we did that for the most part, almost exclusively through what we called short-term renewable products, things that we bought in the market, existing resources that we bought from utilities such as PG&E, SoCal Edison, or marketers that had surplus renewable resources to sell in the market. So these were resources that already existed. Of course, the founding, our founding board wanted us to also try to build actual resources. 
we have the requirement to have long-term PPAs, but those don't require that they be from new resources. They just require that they be long-term contracts. But our board had in its objectives and its strategic plan um, that we wanted to add new resources to the grid. And so we have done that. In 2022, we brought on our first set of new long-term PPAs into our portfolio. So in 2022, you can see that the short-term resources, the one in the kind of bright green color at the top of the stack there, that is essentially, it still makes up a good fraction of our requirements for 2022, but in years past, it was all green. Now we have actual resources that we can say are our resources and they'll be with us for the next 10 to 20 years. Next slide. Oh, one other thing to note here is we're way on target and meeting uh, not just your directives under the, the IRP and strategic plan, but also our requirements under state law. Next slide. So you've probably seen this map in the CEO report, but just to highlight, these are the different PPAs that we have uh, scattered throughout the state and some out of state as well. Our goal when we sign contracts or when we look for resources is to try to diversify across not just technology, so we don't want all solar or all solar plus storage, but we wanna get a good mix of solar, wind, geothermal, and we want them in different locations throughout the state because each of these resources have a cost associated with them. You know, we have a fixed price that we pay, but they also produce value. They generate electricity that we're able to sell into the market, the California Independent System Operator Market, and we get money for those. So diversifying those geographically helps us in our risk management objectives as well. Next slide. This here is just a list of all those projects. Uh, the capacity, the nameplate capacity that we have uh, procured, and what percent of our load we expected to meet in 2025, and uh, the term of the contracts when the board approved them and the authority they gave us, and then the current status. So you can see the ones in green are the ones that are our resources uh, online and counting in our portfolio. Next slide. So again, in 2022, we were excited to bring on, I believe, five new PPAs. So we onboarded those, meaning we brought them into the market, connected them, if they were brand new, into the Cal ISO, flipped the switch and started to receive electricity from them. Um, some of us got to go to some ribbon cuttings and cut some ribbons and see the proce projects firsthand. So um, here just is the, the list of the resources that came online. Um, it wasn't until October that we got the last resource on, but you can see here how these resources have been generating electricity uh, month to month. By 2025, we expect this to be about 60% of our annual needs. Currently, it's only about 23%. Next slide. And then that requirement that we have 65% of our RPS and long-term contracts per compliance year, you can see here, that we do expect to meet um, our long-term requirements in compliance period four, um, where the requirement is 26%, with the resources that we've committed to, we're at 29%, so we have a little bit of a margin there, uh, partly because we were able to take the PG&E uh, voluntary allocation market offer VAMO product. Um, but in the next compliance periods, we have quite a bit of margin in terms of what we uh, have acquired so far. Next slide. Uh, so, two, again, two driving objectives in meeting our clean uh, power supply energy needs. One is RPS, and the other is the SVCE board um, objective to be 100% clean on an annual basis. So, most of that is be, most of the, the clean is met, again, uh, through RPS resources, and we balance those against non-RPS resources. Uh, we started to receive the PG&E allocation for large hydro and nuclear a couple of years ago and we expect to get it in 2023 as well. And that makes up a large fraction of our RPS needs. We get those allocations for free, right? Because we pay for them through the power cost and difference adjuster. And so um, those resources, however, are going to go away. Uh, the Diablo Canyon nuclear power plant that we get the allocations from right now uh, through legislation that was passed this year will be extended and the resource will go to the state it will no longer be a resource that PG&E is able to allocate to us. In addition to that, there's a proceeding underway at the CPUC to take the carbon-free resources, so the large hydro and the nuclear, 
if it's in pg and portfolio, which I don't think it will be anymore, and no longer provide that as an allocation, but rather adjust the PCIA to include the value of the, of the, of the carbon-free attribute. So those resources are likely not going to be available to us beyond 2024 or 2025. And so we have to go out and source those resources in the market. And those resources are really hard to come by. There's no other nuclear that you can buy, right? That's the only remaining, unfortunately, that's the only remaining one in California. So we're really dependent on uh, availability of large hydro either in California or the Northwest. And in California, we were fortunate enough to sign a long-term contract with the federal government for a very small share of their project called the Central Valley Project. And that'll come on in 2025, but it's a very small amount. Um, other resources that we could go to are most likely gonna come from the Northwest where they traditionally come for before we got the allocations. But the problem there is that the neighboring states, Washington and Oregon are also developing their own clean standards. And so we believe that the availability of those resources will essentially dry up. So this is going to become a challenge for us to see how we can meet the annual goal that the board has set, us, set for us um, in an affordable way. And I think at the end of the day, that's what it's gonna come down to is what is it gonna to cost to meet that goal? Next slide. So by law, we have to produce what's called a power source disclosure or a PCL is the other way. It's kind of like a label, like a, like a nutritional label for energy. And every load serving enti entity has to produce this for every product that they serve or they provide. Um, the PCL has you know, some interesting math associated with it. So uh, for our estimated 2022 power uh, PCL, we're estimating right now a 46.8% RPS. When in reality, we've actually bought for Green Star, which is our primary product, 50% RPS. But because of the way the accounting works, because we over procure for carbon free, we have to back out some of our RPS on the power content label. Uh, the COSO geothermal project, the one that we brought on in January, because of the way that the California Air Resources Board treats that resource, it's located in a, in a geographic area that um, is unique, uh, is requiring that we report emissions associated with it. And so we will be showing some emissions, and you can see there it's 76 pounds of CO2 per megawatt hour associated with COSO. This is, again, an accounting situation. Geothermal, all types of geothermal, whether it's this type or wherever it's located or the different technologies, according to the CPC, is a clean resource. It meets the RPS requirements. It's needed, very much needed, to meet our uh, state's clean goals by 2045. So um, while you know, we're not excited to show emissions, we are excited to have this resource in our portfolio. And then the other product that we offer is Green Prime. That's a voluntary product. It's 100% RPS, and we will be meeting the 100% RPS this year. So overall, our RPS for 2022 is estimated at 53.8%, or about 54%. Next slide. So in addition to energy, all of, the, all of what I talked about before was energy. We also have requirements to buy capacity. And capacity is essentially the still the, the resource capability, a project's capability of producing electricity at a given point in time, the maximum capacity. So resource adequacy and, and reliability is really kind of a coordinated function between the California Energy Con Commission, the California Public Utility Commission and the California Independent System Operator. And we've seen some real big challenges and certainly challenges in reliability over the last couple of years, you know, unprecedented heat waves, uh, changes in load, retirements of resources, uh, clean goals that are bringing on a whole bunch of clean resources but that don't produce the same way that a natural gas resource does. And then just the bigger challenge, or another challenge is just the number of LSCs that are now in California, so CCAs. You know, this, we didn't exist in this amount um, a few years ago. So all of this is leading to what's called resource adequacy reform. And these procurement orders that I talked about before that the CPUC was able to make through its integrated resource planning process. So next slide. 
So they've issued, the CPC has issued three procurement orders um, since 2019. The first one uh, was to bring, everybody had to bring capacity on. In total, they were looking for 3,300 megawatts of capacity to be online by 2021 through 2023. We were allocated a share and we met that obligation. In 2021, they issued another summer reliability procurement order, but they allocated it to the, P, to the IOU. So they said, you know, we don't have enough time, you guys do this, and then we'll allocate all the costs to all the ratepayers. And so they were able to, I think, effectively procure that. I'll have to check on that. And then most recently, in June 2021, they issued what they called the midterm reliability procurement order. In total, they asked for 11,500 megawatts of new capacity to come online by 2026. And our share of that was 237 megawatts. Next slide. So we were able to count some of our resources um, and make some significant progress towards meeting this, this requirement of 237 megawatts. Um, but we still have some procurement to do and most notably in the 2024-2025 uh, tranches. Through the California Community Power Joint Powers Authority, which we are a member of, we were able to secure all of what we call the long, long lead time resources, which were for long duration storage and for firm clean resources, AKA geothermal. Uh, so we've met that requirement and uh, we're actively procuring to meet the remaining uh, open position that we have. Next slide. So in summary, the procurement orders, the drought, the scarcity of reliability resources for capacity, these are all driving costs up um, for SVCE, for all the load serving entities for the state of California. And these are driven primarily because of, you know, just the cost of bringing new resources online is just becoming more, higher, more and more expensive due to supply chain issues, labor issues, procurement orders. Believe it or not, procurement orders have the effect of driving up prices. And so all of these are going to drive up our cost of meeting clean energy goals in the future and, and our ability to, to meet these clean energy requirements, whether they're board directives or state directives in a timely manner. And then again, the ability to get these uh, non-RPS or carbon-free hydroelectric resources is going to become more and more and more challenging in the future, especially as everybody now has this requirement to be 100% clean by 2045 and some very aggressive interim targets by 2030 and 2035. So we'll be competing with many other buyers for those clean resources, whereas before we were kind of a little bit out there on our own. Um, resource adequacy reform will make compliance a much greater challenge and increase costs. We're gonna go from having to report and procure to meet very limited targets, you know, to having to do it on a 24 hour basis. So this is gonna cause a lot, a lot of um, uh, craziness in the market, is all I can say, is what we anticipate. It's gonna be a very, a very, very challenging to meet these requirements. In order for us to meet these requirements, we being uh, SVCE and the state, we're gonna have to continue to rely on natural gas resources for reliability. It's just a given fact. Whether we own them or somebody else owns them, they will stay online because they're necessary to balance the intermittent resources that renewable resor resources are. And so, you know, up until now, and even in the future, we meet our resource adequacy, that is SVCE meets it primarily through natural gas capacity resources. We just buy them year to year and we pay the price that we see year to year to meet our RA obligations. And while we have this strategic focus area to look at carbon free 24 by seven, and we certainly have set ourselves up in the types of resources that we procured by using geothermal and wind and solar with a lot of storage, the ability to actually get to 24 by seven or somewhere close to that will be a challenge until this reliability issue because the lights have to stay on and it has to be affordable. Because if it's not affordable, then I think customers will start to leave the state and then we have a bigger affordability problem. So these are some of the challenges that we see um, in not just meeting our objectives in the near term, but long term as well. Next slide. 
So what are we going to focus on in addition to all the other stuff that we're, we're working on is we'll continue to optimize our, um, our PPA resources in the market. We've been relatively successful in how we're managing these resources and, and bringing value to our, um, our customers through these PPA resources. We'll continue to procure clean resources to meet our obligations and SVCE goals. We issued an RFO or request for offers um, in the fall of 2022, and we're currently evaluating those offers, and, and hopefully we'll be able to bring uh, one or two to the board for consideration in the next uh, two or three months. We'll continue to explore additional long-term hydro resources. So this, again, is something that we want to be out there ahead of the game, securing these resources so that we don't have to plan, see, we don't have the uncertainty of whether we're going to make our, our goals year to year. Uh, we will, and we are evalu evaluating the use of long-term natural gas and or standalone storage resources to meet our resource adequacy and reliability requirements. This is a re compliance requirement, and it's something that we, even as a clean energy supplier, have an obligation to help the state and the grid be reliable. Uh, we'll monitor developments in new clean energy technologies, including hydrogen. You know, this is the new kind of everybody's talking about it type thing. Uh, it still remains to be somewhat cost ineffective or expensive, I should say, but we'll continue to monitor it. And then, of course, we will look, because it's a strategic plan focus area and because we believe it's the right thing to do, we will assess the feasibility cost and what strategies we have to um, utilize to achieve carbon free 24 by 7. So that's all I have. Happy to take any questions. Well, thank you. That's uh, quite a presentation. Gives us a lot to think about. Uh, let's see if we have any, uh, uh, we'll say, comments or questions from uh, board members. Director Rennie? I was going to wait, but I didn't see any other questions. If you could go back to slide eight. Um, th I, this just dawned on me. I know I've seen this slide before a few times. Um, um, so when I, it just dawned on me, when I look at this, you see a seasonal shape to the production for solar, and I'm even surprised to see the Mountain View wind also has a seasonal shape to it. And it, it seems to me this is fortuitous because our load is is higher in the summer when there's a lot more electricity used for air conditioning. But what's going to happen when we push heating to be electric? All of a sudden, the renewables don't match the seasonal shape. Right now, we have a, a daily shape problem, which we can get away with battery storage or something like that. What are we going to do further out in, you know, probably starting, you know, we're talking about out in the, you know, buying for out in the future, you know, 2040 kind of thing. By 2040, the, our load shape may not look like this so much anymore. And now we're stuck with what are we going to buy in January? Are we going to have to buy extra solar? But that's going to produce extra in the summer and what's going to be done with it. So it seems to me that we've got a problem in here we need to somehow think about. And as we're buying long-term contracts, maybe we should be thinking, what is the solution to that? Is there wind resources? Is there some re renewable resource that we can be thinking about to hit the, the wintertime months out in the future when our load shape changes? Yeah, I think short of something like geothermal that produces year-round, I think we're really kind of looking at a lot of storage to help meet our you know, day-to-day -day requirements and hour-to-hour -hour requirements. Week to week or month to month, it's a bigger problem. And so it's just going to be, and we're just gonna have to build more capacity than what we need, quite frankly, in order to, to get to, to meet those requirements in those winter months. Mm -hmm. um, looking at wind out of state is also something that produces a, a bit of a more complementary generation profile to solar in state and even to wind in state. So that's another potential resource. Um, offshore wind also produces kind of a nice complementary uh, generation profile. That's a little bit more of a challenge. I think that's, you know, obviously building offshore wind is in California because it's such a deep kind of ocean thing that it creates a new set of challenges and then you have to be able to bring it 
online and everything, but those are other things that the state is looking at as ways to meet that particular, it's not just our problem, by the way, it's everybody's. And of course, hydro helps in the winter months as well. And so if, you know, hydro definitely is a good balancing resource. It's, it has a lot of storage capacity associated with it. It tends to generate um, more in the spring and the summers because that's when the value is, but you can also generate it in any time of the year, so. It's good that it's got that inverse shape to it. I, yeah. I'm worried that in the future, we might be saving our gas peaker plants to run in the winter time because our, our power shape it doesn't match our load shape so well anymore. And yeah. I'm just wondering if we could be thinking about or purchasing something long-term that may do more in the, in the, in the winter months. Thanks. Yeah, these long lead time resources that the CPUC identified, the long duration storage and the, the firm clean resources or you know, geothermal and biomass, I think is what they're hoping part of the solution is gonna be to meet that problem of not having enough clean resources in the winter months and in certain times of the day, but it's a lot of capacity that you have to bring on in order to meet the problem. Because you can bring on a thousand megawatts, but a thousand megawatts doesn't always count, so. Uh, Director Mikechuk. I believe you mentioned there was a 10 year number in there for the length of time a, a power purchase agreement has to be in place? Yeah, that's under SB 350, minimum 10 years. Right, is, is if you enter into a 12 year contract and then you're in nine years to go, does that number drop or is it from when you originally entered into the contract? It's from the original date of, of exit. Understood. Yeah, it's 10 years in total, minimum. Okay, and then it, it seems like on the one slide that you had with the various numbers on it, and I can't remember which one it was, but maybe it was number seven, you mentioned, mentioned hydrogen and we have to be looking to the future to new technologies and new opportunities, but to what extent can we help move new technologies forward or is that outside of, of sort of our mission? Well, I think that the state and the country as a whole are looking at research and development in hydrogen and investing quite a bit of, of dollars in the I guess development and trying different hydrogen type technologies. SVC, I don't believe we have it anything in our. I'll let Garish talk to the strategic planner what we are doing in terms of investing funds there. Great question. Great question. It's something we've thought about, but we haven't actually put in any meaningful resources at SVCE to follow that for the reasons Monica said. Um, I think of a few things, the in, uh, Inflation Reduction Act has really provided a tremendous impetus, uh, especially in the hydrogen side. Uh, we're still too small to make a giant difference. Uh, potentially in California, CC Power is a place where we can look at that and that's one of the reasons we created CC Power is to do things that we can't do on our own. Uh, in your consent calendar, we did four contracts, CC Power done that. We're in the process of hiring a new general manager there, but this person should be in place in March, and this will be a full-time general manager, whereas right now we have someone working at about 30% full-time. So these are the kinds of opportunities that is on this general manager's work plan for year two. Year one is just operationalizing all our current agreements. So it's a very timely question. Uh, Benna Chang, uh, legislative director, is also following uh, where the money is flowing. Uh, so we'll keep this in mind and we'll bring it back in our strategic plan for the coming year. Thank you. Any other questions or comments? I don't see any here. Do we have any uh, from the board uh, online? No? So just thank you for those comments. They prompted some thoughts on, on my, my part. And uh, first off, in terms of, of what are the long-term strategic things, I'm, I'm, I'm on the distribution list for a U University of California Climate Action Network. And what are we going to do with the money for long-term research from Inflation Re Reduction Act and other things? So it's very interesting, but it's, it's very much out there. It strikes me as being kind of beyond our, our nuts and bolts approach of what, what we're doing. Um, 
The other thought has to do with the seasonality. You know, we use geothermal in two different ways. We use it here, as in there's a plant that's taking uh, hot, say, deep, uh, hot water from deep underground and it's producing power from it. When we went on the tour of Google's facility, they showed the one answer to your question, I thought, Director Rennie, and that mm. was geothermal in the sense of storing heat and pulling from it underneath their own building um, on a seasonal seasonal basis. And I thought there's, that sounded like an interesting, but you know, they're Google, they have resources, they can try things out. Maybe that's our role here in California is we can be the, the leaders in, in trying things out like that. Uh, not seeing any other comments. Do we have any others from the public? Uh, go ahead, uh, Mr. Carney. Thanks. You know, I have every confidence that the staff can weather the pressures that come from all of the different Senate bills and CPUC decisions um, because I think they realized, as I hope all of you do, that there are really no alternatives to achieving a carbon-free future, whether that's done in 2045 or some other year. Uh, all of our children and grandchildren and great-grandchildren and those who come after them depend on us solving this very complex set of challenges. Um, when Carbon Free Mountain View led the efforts to create this agency six years ago, our, our very simplistic idea was that we should have all, all renewable carbon free energy and we would not given any thought to the deeper complexities that Monica and Garish and others on the team have to face every single day. Um, so, you know, I'm going to chalk this up to, I believe their hearts are in the right place. Their analytical capabilities are first rate. Uh, they are experienced and they have a great credit rating that not every CCA can boast. And so I have every confidence that with your guidance, they will achieve as much as can be achieved as fast as possible. Thank you for those comments. You know, since I have the floor here, um, you know, one of the things that strikes me is that, you, you know, the analogy of turning to Queen Mary, you know, it takes a long time and a lot of effort to change things. And I feel like we've got two Queen Marys here. One of them is how do we change people's behavior to electrify the things that they do? That takes time and money and infrastructure, you know, heat pumps and cars and all that. Then we've got the Queen Mary of the supply side. And that is how long does it take? Where are we on the curve in terms of... Uh, of economies of scale for solar, because I've seen some things that, that say long term, we have the ability to bring it down, but there's a crunch right now. So I look and I say, if we are determined to decarbonize, and in the interim, those two Queen Marys don't quite line up, and we've changing behavior, and we do have to buy a little more natural gas and to get it going until we get the uh, supply going, is that a bad thing? And I would say no, if it's a temporary sort of thing. So you're getting a little philosophy from me here today. Uh, further philosophy, perhaps. <laughs> yes. As, as I look at what the alternatives are uh, that you were describing, um, there's a lead time to building those things. And I did the ribbon cutting at uh, Rabbit Brush on behalf of SVC. And, you know, it takes several years to get all the pieces in place. And when I heard the, the speeches of what was required to actually put that in place, it's an immense amount of effort and an immense amount of time. And we have to start doing things now to, that are going to come online four or five years from now. And if it's new technologies, then it's, you know, throw in another three years. Yeah. You know, but we have to start soon. All right. All right. Well, thank you for that comments. And then, uh, yes. Uh, we do have a virtual public comment. Great. Uh, Mr. Arnold de Leon. Let's hear from you, Mr. de Leon. Um, thank you. Um, can you hear me? Is yep. Okay, great. Uh, a few quick comments. One, I'm assuming uh, the staff is aware, at least looking at things like hydrogen, is, at least clean hydrogen, is not going to be an energy source. It is just another form of energy storage. Um, I'm probably stating the obvious, but I just want to sort of point that out. Mm -hmm. um, two, uh, I think I heard, uh, and I th and I think there's a broader mindset. 
of adopting the, the idea that, uh, uh, I forget, I'm sorry, I, I forget her name, but the person who was speaking, uh, in thinking about, in particular, around renewables like solar and wind, we're going to need to basically overbuild. The, you know, the practical, the only practical solution for intermittent uh, sources is you're just going to have to, you know, have more than what you need, and you can't just size to either nameplate capacity or whatever. We just have to accept that not, sometimes you're going to have to curtail. The beautiful thing about both solar and wind is curtailing is generally not that difficult compared to, say, a typical uh, 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 fossil fuel plant. Um, and then a final comment is even as we move towards heat pumps, for instance, in, in heating, um, they do have the magic uh, ability of, in the sense we can go past unity, even if you count um, a natural gas powered heat pump, if you think about it that way, is potentially more efficient, likely more efficient, particularly in our climate than a uh, naturally, natural gas heat, uh, heat at, the, uh, at the use source. And so, um, so there's a lot of opportunity there. Historically, I've, I've, you know, I've, I've had a heat pump for like 15 years now. I find it really, uh, historically, it's been very frustrating that the market, the price of a heat pump is ridiculously, has been, has been ridiculously much higher than it should be when it's basically an effing air conditioner with a, a few more parts. Um, and I think there's an opportunity there for leadership in either communities, uh, in, 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 in in efforts like this or at state or national levels to sort of reduce that difference. Um, I've tried to take advantage of some of the incentives. Um, unfortunately, right now they tend to, all, all that happens is they get the uh, installer's markup according to the incentives. So I'm not sure that they're necessarily achieving all of the results, but that's the landscape But uh, as it is. I think we have an opportunity to get to 100% renewable, but we just need to accept the fact that everything is not gonna be used 100% of the time. That's all, thank you. Great, thank you for those comments, Mr. De Leon. Uh, with that, I don't see any other comments. So I wanna thank everybody for a very good discussion and also for your presentation, Ms. Padilla. And with that, let's move on to item number, uh, unnumbered, and that is uh, board member announcements and direction on future agenda items. Do we have any comments from the board in terms of announcements or future items? I, I do see uh, Director Chua, thanks. Go ahead. You're, and you are muted right Thank now. You. Thank you, Chair. I would like to happily share with you that Congressman Rokana was able to secure $24 million this district. Three million of that uh, is we're getting for, for our city's carbon neutral homes uh, incentive program. This is to incentivize family homeowners to convert their fossil fuel uh, appliances to carbon free carbon free ones and this is in line with your cha with chairs comment on um, queen mary's uh, two of your queen marys i think <laughs> because changing changing people's behavior towards uh, carbon free electricity well I'm re we're really happy and and excited to launch this program fairly soon so I just wanted to share that with everyone. Thank Great. you, Chair. Thank you. We're we're happy and excited too. Do we have any other comments? I do not see any here. Okay. With that, uh, thank everybody uh, for having a very nice meeting, and I will now say this meeting is adjourned.